Well, I do uh, bring you greetings. It is a pleasure for me uh, to be here with you. I I have uh, had the privilege of standing in this pulpit before you, the student body of the Masters University for Chapel, several times. And it is always a great joy. It's always a great pleasure. I I count it a privilege to be able to open the Word of God to you. You who are at such a formative time in your lives and in your spiritual lives as you form convictions that will be the rudder for your lives as Christians wherever you go in the world um, for a lifetime. And so uh, for those of you who don't know me, I hear that there are 400 new students on campus this semester. That's wonderful. But for those who don't know me, my name is Mike Riccardi. I uh, am the pastor of local outreach ministries at Grace Community Church and uh, teach at the Master's Seminary in the Theology Department as well. Uh, Originally from New Jersey and moved out here, what was it, 12 years ago to attend the Master's Seminary and uh, just they they haven't been able to to kick me out yet and uh, it's just been a a great joy for me to serve on staff at Grace Church for the past almost 10 years and uh, again just a great joy to be with you. If you would, please open your Bibles to the final book of the, New Testi- of the Old Testament, excuse me, the book of Malachi and chapter 1. I want you to follow along as I read cha- verses 6 through 14. Malachi 1, 6 to 14. God speaking says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then if I am a father... Where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says Yahweh of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? You're presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say the table of Yahweh is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly? Says Yahweh of hosts. But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly? Says Yahweh of hosts. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says Yahweh of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you, for from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name and a grain offering that is pure, for my name will be great among the nations, says Yahweh of hosts. But you are profaning it, in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how tiresome it is, and you disdainfully sniff it, sniff at it, says Yahweh of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, so you bring, and so you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says Yahweh? But cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifice is a blemished animal to the Lord, for I am a great king, says Yahweh of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. Familiarity breeds contempt. I imagine that many of you can think back to a time, maybe for some it's not so far away, maybe when you were first saved, when Christianity was thrilling to you. You had come to grips with the reality of your own sin before a holy God. You had come to see and enjoy the unspeakable majesty of God's holiness. You knew that because the sinless Son of God had absorbed in himself the full exercise of the wrath of God against your sin, that this holy God graciously and mercifully had forgiven you of your sin and granted you eternal life. And fellowship with Jesus in those early days was so sweet. He's like your best friend, never left your side all day. You couldn't wait to carve out some time in your schedule so that you could be alone with him, to read the word, meditate on the word, to to pour out your heart to him in prayer. 
going to church to worship God, fellowship with other believers was the highlight of the week. You couldn't wait to set aside time in your week to, to gather together with the people of God and offer Him a sacrifice of worship in the gathered assembly. And evangelism, well, it seems like you told everybody you came into contact with of this wonderful message of grace and salvation that you had just experienced in your life. There are few things more encouraging than a young believer's guided zeal for Christ. But after some time passes, and you know how this goes, Bible reading and prayer and then church attendance and evangelism, it all kind of becomes familiar. What was once such a joy, such a privilege, such a thrill in our own hearts starts to become burdensome, even wearisome. The Bible just looks thicker and thicker. Our Bible reading plans always seem to have us in the consecration laws of Leviticus or the, the genealogies of First Chronicles. Prayer is reduced to quick requests when something goes wrong. Praying for 10 minutes seems like an hour. Attending church just, to get, just gets to be another appointment on the calendar that forces you to wake up early on Sunday. And if we're not careful, even listening to God's Word preached can become little more than an academic exercise. We stop experiencing these activities for what they are, namely glorious privileges for worship, and we just go through the motions. In so many ways, familiarity, even with these most wonderful, delightful responsibilities, can breed contempt. Something similar was happening with the priests of Israel in the day of the prophet Malachi. Malachi prophesied between 434 and 424 B.C., just over 100 years after Judah's return from the exile in Babylon. And about 80 years before that, just 20 years after the return from exile, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah spoke the words of great promise and encouragement to God's newly restored nation. Through Haggai, God commands Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple. Ezra 3 tells us that when the foundation was laid, everyone sang praises and gave thanks to God. But those who were old enough to remember Solomon's temple wept at the building of Zerubbabel's temple. It just paled in comparison to the splendor and the beauty of that glorious temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. The ragtag, tri ragtag tribe of survivors from captivity came to the bitter recognition that they certainly were not the nation that they used to be. But God promises through Haggai that, that all the nations will come to Jerusalem with their wealth. He says, I will fill this house with glory. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. And then Zechariah 8 promises that there's going to be such peace in Jerusalem that men and women are going to grow old. There's going to be uh, the streets of the city filled with children playing. Eventually he says in Zechariah 8, 7, Behold, I am going to save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west, and I will bring them back, and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. But in Malachi's day, it had been 80 years since God had given these glorious promises, and the nation saw no such thing. And so they began to wonder where God was and when he was going to fulfill all these magnificent promises. And after years and years of waiting and hoping, both the priests and the people became disillusioned. Sure, they still went about their religious business. They celebrated the feast. They offered the sacrifices. But the mundanity of the routine led them to become familiar and bored with the worship of God. Their hearts were hardened. Temple service became little more than going through the motions. And in their case, familiarity did indeed breed contempt. And so God sent the prophet Malachi to rebuke Israel for their unfaithfulness. We see him address such issues as widespread divorce, societal oppression, withholding their tithes and offerings. But among all these problems, Malachi spends almost two whole chapters, from ver chapter 1, verse 6, all the way to chapter 2, verse 9, indicting the priests for their worthless, corrupt worship practices. Say, okay, what in the world does this have to do with me? 
animal sacrifices, priests, altars. The sacrificial system of Israel has been fulfilled in Christ, the perfect sacrifice. And yes, that's true. But the New Testament takes the Old Testament imagery of sacrificial worship and describes the entire Christian's, the Christian's entire life as a sacrificial offering of worship to God. Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That's the language of the priestly temple ministry. Christians offer sacrifice, not animal sacrifice, but the living and holy sacrifice of our entire lives. Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16 says, Through him then, through Christ, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks, that gives thanks to his name, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So our praise, our thanksgiving, our deeds of love and generosity to others, all of these things are described as sacrifices, as if we were priests ministering in the holy place. And 1 Peter, 1, uh, 1 Peter 2, 5 says that we are living stones being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. So you see, the Christian's entire life is a priestly ministry. Every one of us, the way that we live, the way that we serve, the way that we obey or disobey is like the offering of spiritual sacrifices to God. We have entered through the veil of Christ's flesh, Hebrews tells us, into the very presence of the, the spiritual temple of God. We live every day in the presence of God. And though that is an amazing privilege, though that's a marvelous display of grace, it should also strike a holy fear into our hearts. People died for failing to properly revere God while ministering in the holy place. And we are in the holy place every day. And so as we consider Yahweh's word to Israel through Malachi this morning, I want to highlight three marks of worthless worship. Three characteristics of unworthy worship. And my hope is that we would remember that we are a kingdom of priests of the new covenant and that our entire lives are spiritual sacrifices to God through Christ. And as we see these marks of worthless worship from these priests, my hope is that we'll be able to detect the presence of worthless worship in our own lives, put it to death by the power of the Spirit, and worship God in spirit and truth in a manner that he is worthy of. Well, that first mark of worthless worship is their self-righteous self-defense. Self-righteous self-defense. We see this immediately in verses 6 and 7. God says, a son honors his father, a servant his master. If I'm a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? Well, you're, de you're presenting defiled food on my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? This is not a good faith request for information. It is bitter contentiousness. It is hypersensitive self-righteousness. And it characterizes the people's attitude throughout the whole book. Chapter 1, verse 2, God declares he loves them. How have you loved us? Chapter 2, verse 14, for what reason does the Lord not accept our offering? What's wrong with them? Verse 17, you've wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied, them, wearied him? Chapter 3, verse 8, how have we robbed you? Verse 13, what have we spoken against you? The whole book, their default response to God's rebuke is not the response of true worshipers. Sacrifices of God, David tells us in Psalm 51, are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. But this is not humble, contrite submission. This is not the kind of self-examination and broken-hearted repentance that characterize those who know their own weakness, who desperately want to be rid of sin in their own lives. Now, this is the response of those who trust in themselves to be righteous. 
These are the kind of people who are shocked, shocked, I tell you, to learn that they could be offering worship to God that he's not pleased with. It's a telltale sign of self-righteousness. When a self-righteous person is criticized about their worship practices, they take personal offense because their worship is about them. What do you mean that my hand flailing and dancing all in the aisles is distracting to people? I mean, this is my way of worshiping God. Pugh, legalist, fundamentalist, who does she think she is? I like the light show and the smoke machines, okay? Makes me feel comfortable. Music from heretical worship bands really makes me feel close to God. Figure that one out. Why are you harshing my mellow? What are you, the worship police? See, worship isn't about God. Worship is about, isn't about pleasing Him. It's not about worshiping Him according to His revealed word. Worship is about my feelings, my comfort, my preferences. This is the response of self-focused, self-centered, self-righteousness. A true worshiper hears a rebuke like this from God's spokesman and is genuinely concerned. He wants his worship to be pure. He wants his worship to be acceptable to God. But when the self-righteous take personal offense, when they're rebuked, they reveal that their religious activity is about themselves more than anything else. What do you mean we've despised your name? How have we defiled your altar? We keep bringing the sacrifices. We keep this temple going. We're actually keeping our end of the bargain, God. What about you? Where's the restoration that you promised? Where's the glory in this temple that you promised? Something like that creeps into our hearts. I keep reading my Bible. I keep going to church. I keep going to chapel. When is this spiritual growth and satisfying communion with Jesus going to kick in here? These priests figured they were righteous. They were doing what God required of them. But the righteous worshiper doesn't arrogantly defend himself when God criticizes. The righteous worshiper, always aware of his own weakness and proneness to wander, humbly and thankfully receives biblical correction. And let me ask you, how how do you do in that area? Someone confronts you about your worship practices, which is to say any part of your life lived before God because every aspect of your life is worship. When someone addresses your sin, what's your default reaction? To defend? Somebody says, you know, friend, Christians go to church. Christians are members of local churches. Your profession of love for the invisible, universal body of Christ rings hollow if you refuse to be accountable to a particular visible expression of that universal body in a local church church. You can't love Christ and despise his bride. Christ purchased the church with his own blood. She is precious to him. And if you love him, she will be precious to you as well. There are a host of New Testament texts that can't be obeyed apart from active participating membership in a sound local church. And yet your friend says to you, it doesn't seem to be that important to you. What's going on? What's your response? I I make it to church sometimes. I I read my Bible most days. Look, I come to the Master's University. What do I need at church if I'm around believers all the time? If that's your attitude, if your response to correction is to list off all the religious activity you're involved in in a way of defending yourself, it may be that your acts of worship or more about yourself than about giving God what he's worthy of. It's a call to self-examination. A second characteristic of worthless worship is empty formalism. Unworthy worship is marked by self-righteous self-defense, number one, and number two, by empty formalism. Look at the end of verse six. 
how have we despised your name? He says, you're presenting defiled food upon my altar. But how have we defiled you? In that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? When you present the lame and sick, isn't it evil? And then he repeats the charge again in verse 13. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what's lame or sick. Should I receive that from your hand? The law was clear. Acceptable sacrifices to Yahweh were to be blemishless, without defect, Leviticus 22, 19. And yet they disregarded that. The priests, whose responsibility it was to protect the holiness of Yahweh's sanctuary, they offered the blind, they offered the sick, they offered the lame, they offered God their worst rather than their best. They offered what would cost them the least. They had no category for sacrifice that was a sacrifice. Who cares if the animals have stuff wrong with them? They're going to get burned anyway, right? Besides, the sacrifices are being offered, aren't they? I mean, the ritual is being performed. See, the whole task was nothing but an external duty. It was empty formalism. They were just going through the motions. If their hearts were in it, they would have gladly desired to give God the best of what they had to offer. But worshiping God according to the prescriptions of his own word was not their concern. What about us? We who are a holy priesthood, who offer up spiritual sacrifices to God by our entire lives of worship. I think if we take on a stock of our own lives, it's not long before we realize we fail in just the same way that the priests of Israel did. We don't give to God what he's worthy of. We don't give him our best. Bible reading and prayer take a back seat to other things that seem more important. We give God our leftovers. Squeeze in the devotional time, if at all. Plenty of time for entertainment, social media, movies, music, which are all good things, lawful, recreational activities in and of themselves, but only in their proper place, only when we've properly prioritized our personal worship of prayer and scripture reading, of church attendance and involvement in fellowship. God calls for our first fruits, not the leftovers. He tells the priests in verse 8, not even your governor would accept that kind of sacrifice as payment, for ta as payment of taxes. I think that applies to us in a big way. We offer to God what we would never dream of offering to our secular employers or to our professors. Which of us would ever think going into work, I think about going into work a few hours late Monday morning because we didn't get enough sleep the night before. But how many times have you skipped the early service or church altogether because Saturday was a late night? We wouldn't treat our jobs that way. We don't treat our schoolwork that way. And God help us, we treat Jesus that way. We bring the blind animal for sacrifice. What's that mean? How does that apply to us? Well, it means to worship God in ignorance with the eyes of our spiritual understanding as it were shut and blinded to the revealed truth of God. It's, fa it's to fail to bring the truth of the scriptures to bear on our worship so that we innovate rather than worship God as he's prescribed we bring the blind when we bypass or disengage the mind in favor of emotionalism. When, when worship becomes more about how we feel than what God deserves and demands from us. We bring the sick for sacrifice when we're cold or dull or lifeless in our worship. Our minds may be engaged, but we don't make heart work of it. We go through the motions and we stand when we're supposed to stand, sit when we're supposed to sit, sing when we're supposed to sing, quiet down when we're supposed to pray, listen to the sermon, and our heart is unengaged. What's Jesus say about that? He, he rejects those, indicts those who worship him with their lips but whose hearts are far from him. Matthew 15, 8 and 9, he says, in vain do they worship me in emptiness. And we bring the lame when we allow our minds and hearts to be distracted by empty thoughts, letting our minds wander as we think about the next class or the homework assignment that's due or what we're going to have for lunch. Our entire lives 
our sacrifices of worship. But the pinnacle of our worship comes on Sunday morning in the gathered assembly where we gather as the people of God together with our brothers and sisters where the Lord is enthroned on the praises of his people. And what sacrifices do you bring to the temple? We are not to endure a sermon. We're to make sure our minds are fully engaged so that we perceive the truth being proclaimed from God's word and are properly affected by it so that the truth of God permeates, uh, penetrates through our minds and inflames our hearts so that our hearts overflow in the genuine adoration and pure worship of God that issues in a holy life. See, if we're not careful, all of our doings can become little more than going through the motions, the empty formalism of the priests of Malachi's day. What's God think of that? Verse 10. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. You know what? Keep your offering. If you can't give me what is in your heart... I don't care what is in your hands or on your lips. God gets so fed up with their shallow and casual approach to worship, he'd rather the temple be closed down. No worship is better than blasphemous worship. He says in Isaiah 1, 11 to 15, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. And in the same way he told the people of Isaiah's day, he took no pleasure in their sacrifices. He looks at the priests, Malachi 1.10, and he says, I have no pleasure in you. And I mean, just what a statement. Could you imagine hearing those words from Almighty God, the judge of all the world, the God who sees to the depths of your heart, the God who knows you as you are, looking, looking at you with the piercing eye of omniscience and saying, I take no pleasure in you. No, I mean, what I want more than anything in the world is to delight the heart of my Savior and my God. I want the one that I love more than life itself to look upon me, see the fingerprints of his own grace, and be pleased with the work of his hands. So I need to search my heart. I need to confess. I need to repent and seek his grace so that I might offer to him what he is worthy of by the grace that he's given me. And he's worth more than leftovers. He doesn't accept the lame, the blind, and the sick, the half-hearted, the begrudging and the ignorant, determined to put to death by the Spirit of God any empty formalism that might be lingering in your life and commit yourself by His grace to worship Him and serve Him in spirit and truth through Christ, the perfect worshiper. Not only is unworthy worship marked by self-righteous self-defense and by empty formalism, but third, it's marked by contempt for your duty. Contempt for your duty. Look at verse 12. He repeats what he's mentioned in verse 7. He says, you're profaning it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how tiresome it is and you disdainfully sniff at it. And that term, disdainfully sniff, ESV has it as snort. It's the Hebrew word nafach, almost onomatopoetic, right? It's to sniff or snort with contempt. It's like having your arm twisted to do something you can't bear to do, like a, a child who voices his disgust and whines, okay, all right, fine. Insolent, complaining, bitter contempt. But don't we say that more than we'd like to admit, maybe even if it's just in our hearts? My, how tiresome. The work of the Lord is getting to church before 9 a.m. after a long week can be tiresome. Going to Sunday school or fellowship group or Bible studies can take away from the rest we think we need after the busyness and stress of the work week. Skip the personal worship time to sleep in. 
Think about evangelism. I don't know if there's a greater satisfaction and joy than proclaiming the gospel to someone who stands in need of eternal life, rehearsing that great gospel by which we've been saved, and yet how easy is it to be embarrassed or hesitant or fearful in that joyful duty? And all these wonderful privileges, there are days when we say to ourselves, my, how tiresome it is. And we disdainfully sniff, ugh. Here we go again. When we react that way, what do we communicate about a life of following Jesus? We communicate that it's contemptible. We say with our actions what the priest said with theirs. The table of the Lord is to be despised. But 1 John 5, 3 says God's commandments are not burdensome. And as a kingdom of priests, people who minister to each other as the body of Christ, to those in the unbelieving world as well, Christians must communicate by our attitudes, actions, and speech that the the worship and service of the Lord is delightful. That's how we stimulate one another to love and good deeds. We say with David, Psalm 27, verse 4, the one thing I want is to behold the beauty of the Lord and to be about his ministry in his place. And then we live like that's true. That communicates that Christ is glorious. That to be employed in his service is so satisfying that far from contempt for our duty, we delight in our duty. He's just that enjoyable. He's just that lovely. I I can suffer the loss of everything else in this life, least of all some sleep, and call it gain because I have him. My, how tiresome it is? No. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Yahweh of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of Yahweh. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is becoming. Those are the cries of a worshiper who loves the church of Christ. I hope seeing the marks of unworthy worship will help you identify such marks in your own lives. But once you find it, once you recognize it in your own life, what do you need to do? You need to get rid of it. We need to put the deeds and attitudes of unworthy worship to death. To mortify it at its root and not just pick the fruit off the top of the tree, but to lay the axe at the root of the tree, we need to understand, therefore, what causes worthless worship. We've seen the characteristics, but what's the source? Where does it come from? The source of of worthless worship is a failure to properly esteem God's glory and honor his name. Look at verse 10. He says, I won't accept an offering from you there at the end. And then in verse 11, for the reason I won't accept it is because from the rising of the sun even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. In every place, incense is going to be offered to my name and a grain offering that's pure for my name will be great among the nations. This is why. God's regard for his own name is why the sacrificial laws were as they were. Not because he's some sort of arbitrary narcissist, but because he esteems his name and his glory above everything in the world. Because he actually is worthy of blemishlessness, of perfection. And therefore his people must esteem his name and his glory above everything in the world. He needs to be treated in a way that is commensurate with his own character. He says in verse 6, if I'm a father, where's my honor? Kavod. Where's my glory, my my weight, my gravity? Later on he says, the priests despise my name, which is the term baza, means to regard lightly. Just like Esau despised his birthright, regarded it so lightly that he sold it to Jacob for a meal. Rather than regarding him as weighty and worthy of reverence, they treated him as if He were insignificant and common. But his name will be great among the nations. And he says, but you, verse 11, my name will be great among the nations, but you, my people, and more than that, my priests, verse 12, you're profaning it. 
how you feel about the worship of God is the way you feel about God. The way you treat the worship of God is the way you treat God. How are we profaning your name? Because you're profaning my table. You're profaning my worship. Same is true for us. Your actions are shaped by what you believe about God. You will always act in line with your theology. And if a sober survey of your life tells you that you're engaging in unworthy worship, the answer is not to just grit your teeth, try harder, just pray longer, or, or read earlier in the day, attend church more often. No, the answer is to see God as great as He sees Himself. It's to saturate the eyes of your heart with the vision of the glory of God revealed in the face of Christ. If the source of worthless worship is regarding God's name too lightly, we need to cultivate our affections to love His name, to behold the beauty of His majesty, to treasure His glory. He's actually worthy of this from us. This is where the war against sin is waged, at the level of spiritual sight of regard for God's name. I'm not calling you to willpower religion. I'm saying go to battle with your sin, fighting to get a more exalted view of God, to cultivate a deeper appreciation of the honor of His name, because that is what will elicit worthy worship. Of course, that glory and that honor is no more wondrously displayed than in the cross of Christ. And friends, if, if you're here today and discerning that you're Religious activity has amounted to nothing more than worthless worship. I would invite you to look to the one who has lived a life of worship that was perfectly consistent with the demands of the holiness of God's name. To the Lamb of God who offered his body as a once for all sufficient sacrifice and who poured out his blood to satisfy the Father's wrath against unworthy worshipers. And who rose again triumphant over death, powerful to forgive the sins of all who turn from their sin and trust in him alone for righteousness before a holy God. Come to Christ. Trust the perfect worshiper. And those in Christ who recognize that I'm an imperfect worshiper, that I'm just, I'm not an unbeliever, but, but I have not me- measured up to this standard, you're right. You haven't. Christ has for you as well. And I want you to draw strength from his perfect record of worship. That he he drapes over your shoulders like a robe of, of righteousness. And he sees Christ where he should see the the worthlessness of your own sin. Battle, fight that battle knowing that you've been forgiven through him if you've trusted in him. Fight that battle knowing you're already accepted even if your actions haven't fit that. But then go and bring your practice in line with that exalted position. Don't be be the hypocrite whose position and practice don't match. Find strength from grace to live a holy life of worthy worship. Let's pray. Father, this is an indictment of our sins. We, we know that it's in the Bible for us to, to hear and read and consider, even if it stings. We know it's not always pleasant, but we pray that you would wield the scalpel as the great physician and wound where you must, prune the tree that it might ultimately be more fruitful. And let us taste the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice. Let us feel the salve of Calvary. Because though we are wounded by the word of God, that same word points us to the word become flesh who binds up all our wounds and gives us grace that we might worship in a way that you find acceptable. Oh, Father, sanctify the offerings of the, of the worship of our lives, which we know to not be sufficient for you, but sanctify them, sweeten them, be pleased by the aroma because They've been sanctified by the work of your Son. May we put to death what must be put to death in us, what is earthly in us, even that which seeps in to what we think is spiritual about us. Give an honest assessment to these young men and women here today and yet cause them to stand on grace and run to Christ 
our strength and our hope. We pray in his name. Amen.